Welcome to the Sunday Message of the Bible GPS. Today we're going to focus on a very relevant topic and that is the impact of name calling. And we're also going to focus on why do we have so much name calling. And if we understand the why, it can help us maybe to stop the name calling. But before we're going to read our passage, let us just bow our heads in prayer. God, we thank you for this amazing day. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you as the loving Father, the compassionate God. Thank you, Lord, that we can acknowledge that you are the creator of the universe. You are the creator of all the galaxies. And still, you are also focused on so much detail that you love us, that we are the focus of your amazing love. My prayer is, Lord, that you will open the scripture to us, that it can take root and that we will have a better understanding of the beautiful passage of Mark chapter 3. We pray it in your name. Amen. So we're going to read from Mark chapter 3 from verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him, and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, his end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. I'd like to start with a question. What is the worst thing that someone has called you in your lifetime? Maybe you don't want to think about that because maybe it still hurts you. But I think we all have experienced some sort of name calling. And you are actually in good company when you've experienced name calling because Jesus also experienced name calling. He was actually called by his own family. He's out of his mind when you read verse 21. And when you read verse 22, the religious people told Jesus, you are demon possessed. Just imagine people calling the most loving, caring, compassionate human being, the most hospitable human being who ever lived. They called him demon-possessed and that he's out of his mind. That is crazy. Why would people do that? And maybe you also wondered, but why did people call me bad names? Why did I experience the impact of name-calling? Because you feel, but you don't deserve it. And we feel that about Jesus. He's the most loving, caring human being ever who lived. And still, he was called these bad things. I think it's good to have a little bit of a investigation or a little bit of a look what is behind name calling and i firmly believe what was behind the name calling of jesus is still behind the name calling of what we experience today and when i think about what is behind name calling two words come to mind the first one is boundaries and the other one is hospitality but maybe you think but why those two words maybe you were thinking of other two words like jealousy and fear that is why people call other people bad names because of fear and jealousy. Well, that is part of the mix. But I think if we really want to go to the root of name calling, 
we need to look at the word boundary and the word hospitality. Let's start with the word boundary. Now, boundaries can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. What is good about boundaries? Well, the good thing of boundaries is that it helps you to feel safe and secure because you know what is right and you know what is wrong. So boundaries can be a very healthy thing where you feel safe and secure. But boundaries can be a negative thing as well. How can it be negative? Well, I'll explain to you why boundaries can be negative. When we have boundaries, many times we write our own rules and regulations to protect and to keep our own insecurity at bay. And when we write all those regulations and rules about our boundaries, many times we can keep other people out. That is the negative of boundaries, that our rules and regulations, we keep people out. We don't write it in such a way to benefit our neighbor. We actually write it in such a way to benefit ourselves to keep our own insecurity at bay. And this is exactly where the Pharisees go wrong. Because they had many rules and regulations. They created more rules and laws than you could even imagine. Just to keep them secure and safe. Just to keep their own insecurities at bay. And Jesus had a problem with that. And that brings me to the other word, hospitality. Now, when we read about hospitality in the Bible, hospitality is many times different than we think what hospitality is. For many people, hospitality is that you show patience and grace to people, strangers who come into your area or your club or your church or your company. You show love to strangers. That is what hospitality is. You show grace and patience in order for them to become like you and to think like you. But when we go to the hospitality of Jesus, hospitality is just another word to care and to love the stranger. And when we look at the hospitality of Jesus, it was lavish. It was unconditional, gracious. It was so wide, so big that it goes across all boundaries. And that is the problem that our rules and regulations can hinder many times God's hospitality to reach other people because it goes against our rules and regulations. Let's go to chapter 1 then I will explain to you how the hospitality of Jesus actually clashed with boundaries. And when that happens, people will call you names because they feel threatened, they feel insecure, they don't want to expose themselves to you. And then you feel that the best way to deal with it, you label them, you call them names because they're not like you. And when you do that, you hinder the hospitality of Jesus because the hospitality of Jesus is a transforming power and Jesus wants every single human being on this world to experience the transforming power of hospitality because hospitality of Jesus is unconditional. It doesn't like boundaries. It doesn't like boundaries where it keeps hospitality out. So in chapter one, Jesus said, my kingdom is at hand. And the kingdom of God was Jesus' main message. You get the word kingdom 72 times in the four Gospels because Jesus' message was all about his kingdom, to make people part of his kingdom. Like last Sunday, we saw that you need to be born again to be part of God's kingdom. And God's kingdom is a kingdom of hospitality. And then Jesus really showed us that hospitality. How did he show us that? Well, he actually called disciples in chapter 1, 2 and 3. And one of the disciples he called was a tax collector. And the Pharisees and the Jewish speaking people did not like the tax collectors because they did abuse the Jewish speaking people by asking more than they need to ask for the taxes. So they were not part of the structure. They were the outsiders. And Jesus made a, a tax collector, Levi, 
which is actually Matthew, the gospel author of Matthew, he made him a disciple because Jesus want, wanted him to experience the transforming power of hospitality. And then Jesus met a leper and lepers were people that you don't touch because then you are unclean. And what did the leper do? The leper said, please help me. And Jesus reached out to him and touched him. Beautiful. Because hospitality, it actually crosses all boundaries. The Pharisees would have said, how, how could he touch a leper? Now he's unclean. But hospitality goes across all boundaries. And then Jesus met people who were demon possessed and he cast out demons. And because of that, people labeled him because he's not part of their rules and regulations. And he healed people on the Sabbath and the Pharisees went crazy. How could he heal people on a Sabbath? Because their rules said you cannot work on a Sabbath. Therefore, Jesus worked when he healed someone. But for Jesus, someone's need is always more important than rules and regulations. You see, when the hospitality of Jesus clashes with the negative boundaries where you want to keep people out, then there will be a labeling of Jesus. Then you will experience name calling. Then Jesus was very clever. He said, you call me demon possessed? How can a Satan, a demon, cast out another demon? It will not work that. Then it's a house against his house and a kingdom against his kingdom. It will never work like that. Everyone knew that Jesus cast out bad demons. So how would Satan cast out bad demons? So he said, just use your common sense. You're ridiculous to label me like that. Then Jesus said something very strong. He said, if you ascribe the work of God to Satan, that is is the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit. And that sin, God will not forgive. When you take the gracious work of Jesus' hospitality and you label it as from evil, from Satan, that is the unforgivable sin. And that is very sad because God wants people to experience the hospitality, His compassion. Because that is the transforming power. That is what the world needs. More compassion, more hospitality. So it's all about the transforming power of hospitality. And that reminds me of a book by Danny Meyer. He's a New York best-selling author. And the name of his book was Setting the Table, the Transforming Power of Hospitality in the Business World. He was in the food industry, or he's probably still in the food industry in New York City. And he said, the reason why I'm successful is not only about my good food, but it is my intentional focus on hospitality. Because he said, when people come to a restaurant, they expect good service. But good service doesn't let people feel good about themselves. He said, it is hospitality that makes people feel good about themselves. And that reminds me of what Maya Angelou said. She said, people will forget what you say and also people will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel and that is the transforming power of hospitality henry Nowen said that hospitality is not there to change people but it is just to create a space where change can happen and this is what jesus did jesus created that amazing space where people felt welcome and then change happened because change needs to come from the inside. Jesus never put fear in people. Jesus gave people hospitality. And another word for hospitality is unconditional love. That is why he was followed by the crowds. He was actually like a rock star because the world was in need of hospitality. It is as if people wanted to tell Jesus, thank you for who we are when we are with you because you don't judge us he create just a space for us where change can happen and then shona nyquist she's another new york best-selling author she said the following about hospitality she said the heart of hospitality is when you invite someone to your home 
and when they leave, they feel better about themselves and not better about you. That is the heart of hospitality. One can probably say it in a different way. True hospitality is not to open your home, but it is to open your heart to someone. It is to invite someone in your heart so that people can realize that you are like all the other people in the world, that you are also wrestling with stuff, that you are also broken, that you are also vulnerable. And that's the transforming power of hospitality, is to create a space for change, is to create a space where a stranger can become a friend. This is what we need. In these days, I hear many churches wondering what will happen after COVID. Will people go back to church? Other people are resting. How can we get more younger people in the church? I think we need to focus on hospitality. Many times we focus on the governance of our churches, of our denominations, the rule book, those things that determine who we are. And I have experienced many times those things can be a hindrance for the hospitality of Jesus. Because many times we want to be in step of what the church believes instead of being in step what the Holy Spirit wants us to be. And I was thinking the other day of an image and I got the image of a glove box and a dashboard. Many times we have our church governance book on the dashboard that that needs to determine our direction. We want to take all our problems and shovel it in a process as if the process will take care of it. But for me, the governance book of churches needs to be like the manual of a car. It needs to be in the glove box. You seldom look at it. Only when you want to change a light bulb or want to you want to see why is this red light on your dashboard. So you need it when necessary. But what you need on your dashboard is a GPS because so many people feel lost. We need a GPS for life and God has given us a GPS. Psalm 119 verse 105 says it so well. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light on my path. And when you read God's word, you will see it's all about hospitality. It is all about unconditional love. Not rules and regulations to keep people out. Not rules and regulations to keep our insecurities at bay. But it is to open our hearts and show the world the power of vulnerability. Where people can be invited into your heart and realize my only security in this world is to know that I'm loved by God and God showed it through Jesus Christ on the cross. May God bless you to show more hospitality wherever you go. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your amazing word. Thank you, Lord, that we can go and read the scripture and then the scripture will change us, will transform us because the Bible tells us that it is about hospitality. It is to love the stranger, not to conform to our rules, but to create a space for change. Thank you, God, that your grace is not flat, but your hospitality and your grace is around. It encompasses every single human being. We are so thankful for that, that no one is out of reach of your hospitality. I pray, Lord, for our churches that we will rediscover the transforming power of hospitality is to make ourselves vulnerable, not to have these rules to keep people out, but to open up and say, yeah, we have rules and regulations to keep ourselves safe and secure, but we always have place for the stranger. We always have hospitality, because we portray the love of God. I pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. So wherever you go, God is sending you. God is sending you with the love of Jesus in your heart. To show hospitality is to show people that rules and regulations are not there to keep people out, 
but it's there to help people to feel safe, that they will experience your hospitality. And when you show the world this unconditional, compassionate, indescribable hospitality, you will get probably people who will call you names because you mingle with people like Jesus, the sinners. And then the people said, how could he mingle with sinners? May God's love take you to places where you can tell people, bring on the name calling, because in the name of Jesus, I'm willing to take it. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Father and the fellowship of His Spirit be with you. Amen.